Hi, Andrew. This is the uh, Jewish Socialist Bund uh, Vanguard Circle, or the and also uh, the uh, Vanguard Circle of the uh, Jewish Bundes Movement, the activists yeah, of the uh, Jewish Socialist Bund, including uh, Comrade Net here, who is not able to connect to it with his audio yet. So we're going to start, and hopefully he can jump in. So it's interesting, you know, that we're in such diverse regions. You know, you're in Tennessee, I'm in Quebec, and Net is in uh, Arizona. So we're beginning uh, to connect. The Bund is uh, coming together. And it seems it's historically opportune as well, because, you know, the Jewish Marxists don't know what to say to the uh, Jewish community. They have uh, nothing to say that, you know, is uh, of interest to them, because all they have is, you know, demonstration slogans, it would seem. They don't know what else to say. There's also a problem with uh, the uh, anti-Zionist bandwagon that's happening now, onto which... In the past, some fascists have jumped in order to promote anti-Semitism and uh, a bandwagon on which many others, you know, are jumping on, you know, with uh, a lot of verbiage that uh, doesn't make a distinction between Jewish people and, and the Zionist faction of the Jewish people. Yeah, you agree? Yes, I absolutely agree. Someone am I, uh well, it's kind of a group therapy type thing I went to actually actually told me that I'm actually the problem because I'm Jewish. I was wearing this and my uh, my yampa gun I was told that I was the problem. Oh, really? Yeah. A yamaka itself is the problem. <laughs> As if a yamaka can do all of the damage that the that the Zionists are doing. Completely uh, irrational. Yeah. They also called me the, the dreaded Kessler. What's that, Kessler? Yeah, they told me they called me the the Kessler. What's that? I don't, I've never heard of that. Kike. It's the same thing as Kike. Yeah. Huh, I haven't heard of that insult. Oh my! There's more than one, I suppose. They yeah. called me. They called me a kind. Wow. Oh my. Yeah, the Zionism is going to be such a disaster for the Jewish people. But nonetheless, uh, I saw a poll which said that fifty percent of Jewish Americans are in favor of a ceasefire. That is, in other words, they're not Zionists. So that's you know a very good total, you know, because it used to be only twenty percent. Now it's fifty percent. Okay, I'll accept that. That's progress, I guess. Yeah. I think the majority of Jewish people aren't even Zionists. Like the majority of Zionists, for that matter, are probably Christians who want there to be a battle of Armageddon. Mm. Yeah, and that's supposed to bring back their their Messiah. Yeah. Their God. No, it's not even a messiah. It's supposed to be a god or something. Okay, well. Good well luck. my my grandfather's church, well, his parents came here from Russia and they were Ashkenazi Jews. Somehow he got he got involved in a church that was somewhat philo Semitic since they go on to church on Saturday, but at the same time they also uh somewhat Christian because they believe in well their Messiah Jesus Christ hmm. that sounds like the seventh Adventist or pretty much actually yeah uh -huh. well well it's a sort of a strange mixture of uh, Christianity and Judaism but Judaism <laughs> Uh, only considers that uh, a messiah or messianic age would come about with uh, the establishment of peaceful relations, you know, internationally. Whereas the Christians seem to think the opposite, that it would, that their messiah or their God would come about in a context of a war, some kind of, a, you know, world war, which is 
sort of undesirable. <laughs> Why would they want, you know, uh, their Messiah to come together with a war? Why would they want the war to happen as if that's a precondition for the return of the Messiah? It doesn't make any sense. You know, if the purpose of the Messiah is to bring about peace, then what is their Messiah supposed to come and impose peace on the world? I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. Christians have been uh, pretending to doing to be doing that, you know, for the last uh, couple of hundred years. Hasn't worked. Yeah. No, and uh, one thing that's particularly uh, absurd about the church that my grandparents went to is that they upheld this certain ideology called British Israelism. In oh, yes. Anglo-Saxons are a form of the 12 tribes of Israel. Hmm. Uh-huh. Quite <laughs> absurd, to say the least. Hmm. What, did they consider themselves to be a tribe of Israel or something? That yes. doesn't make any sense, yeah. I mean, Israel is the Jewish people. So, you know, in Hebrew, uh, Comrade Nettie, he taught me the Hebrew words to say that the state is not Israel. Hamadinat velo Yisrael. Israel is the name of the Jewish people, not of the state. And What's in fact, you know, the, the prophet Samuel said that the Jewish people as a nation should not have a king, should not have a state. What's and yet they wanted mean? wanted to be a nation like other nations anyway. And so they got they got uh, they got shafted. You know, they they did get some uh, a line of kings, which eventually split the whole community into two uh, separate uh, pieces, into Samaria and Judea. And then, uh, you know, that left things open, you know, to being invaded and occupied and then dispersed. And then the Romans came and destroyed everything. So, you know, the idea of having a king, you know, certainly didn't help. What helps is when the people are united and can resist uh, together. And uh, the king divided the Jewish people and not united the Jewish people. That's exactly. what I can see what happened. There's Nat. Can you hear us now, Nat? Maybe not. Anyway. I think what's especially ironic about the fact that my grandfather joined is the fact that he himself was actually an Ashkenazi Jew and not an Anglo-Saxon. And he still believes that the Anglo-Saxons are... In fact, it's some it's Semitic people. Ah, uh, well, I mean, like people can can believe what they want, right? It doesn't have to fit into facts or anything like that. No, I, I agree, but no, they they think it's an ethnic thing themselves, though. They think it's completely ethnic based. Uh, it's uh, it's bizarre, you know. There's also. Uh, yeah, I've heard of another sort of a Christian sect that calls themselves Akkadian, Akkadians, and they think that they come from uh, Mesopotamia, because there was a tribe there once called the Akkadians, and, and they claim, you know, to be descendants of that tribe. I doubt it, you know, probably they're still living there in Iraq, which is Mesopotamia, so that settles that. But um, the Christian Protestant, you know, thesis that they are a chosen people, because they choose to copy the uh, the New Testament interpretation of the Old Testament, in which they claim that the Jewish people own exclusively the Holy Land, and that Muslims you know don't have any place there. And so they sent a number of crusades in there to get rid of the Muslims, and they happened to get rid you know a mass murder of the Jewish people as well in Jerusalem in particular. And then they got booted out. Then they figured out, you know, that uh, they have to have, you know, a surrogate. The British Empire, after occupying uh, Palestine, basically, in 1917, you know, and General Allenby, you know, stated that this was the last crusade because he intended to make it a permanent crusade. Well, turned out that the only way they could do that, you know, was by enlisting the Zionists as, in effect, mercenaries to act on behalf of the British Empire and to make uh, their uh, Zionist state into a uh, an affiliate 
of the uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, world uh, uh, power structure, which is now being led by the United States of America, of course. But it's still, you know, this Anglo-Saxon trip in which Cromwell in particular, you know, like way back when, he wanted to uh, export uh, all the British Jewish people, you know, to, to Palestine and turn it into a British colony. The Jewish people refused. Napoleon tried to do the same thing with the Jewish people in Morocco. The Jewish Moroccans, they refused as well. Cromwell was also horrible to the Irish, too, because uh, mm. the, the uh, my Irish ancestors during well, the what they call the Great Famine. Yeah. Well, they say they say they were irresponsible with the potato, but what really happened, like, I'll say for instance, like in the history books here in the U.S., say that the Irish ran out of potatoes because they were kind of irresponsible with them. <laughs> well, they didn't control it. Their country was occupied. The potatoes exactly. were just taken. You know, that's it. That's all. They're gone. Yeah. And they starved just like the uh, uh, Palestinians in Gaza are starving now. Right. And uh, it makes me think. It's, it's just, I'm sorry. It's just, it's a horrible thing what's going on in all parts of the world. Like, even Myanmar, for instance. There's this Buddhist, some Buddhist monks massacring Rohingya Muslims too. Yeah, that's bizarre, isn't it? They're supposed to be pacifists, aren't they? Huh. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Well, but another point, you know, on this uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, filial, uh, this this uh, this uh, admiration that the Zionists have, you know, for the Anglo-Saxon world, you know. They, in effect, they're assimilated into the Anglo-Saxon mentality, and they've adopted the same sort of uh, notions of the nation state and what they can do with it. Now, but consider that it was England in 1290 that expelled the Jewish population. They were the yep. first European country to expel the Jewish population, you know, because they wanted to be pure Anglo-Saxon, I suppose. But, you know, Anglo-Saxon in itself is not pure because it's composed of both Anglos and Saxons, you know, like by definition, <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> but that's, you know, the same kind of mentality that the German philosopher Hegel had about the Germans, you know, when she thought that, you know, the German state, nation state should be a purist state. And so he only recognized Prussia as a German state. And when it became affiliated with all the provinces around there, you know, with all the other tribes, that were, you know, German, Germanic, you know, but not pure uh, Russian, uh, pure Prussian. And uh, Prussians, you know, were like the aristocrats, you know, feudal lords. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, Germany became, you know, something that he didn't conceive of, you know, because it didn't fit into a stereotype of the uh, pure nation state. But nonetheless, you know, they pretended that they were. <laughs> so, you know, and then the Zionists are doing the same thing. You know, I can't believe, you know, how how captured the mentality of the Zionists is into the European model of national chauvinism, which of course degenerates into fascism and then Nazism. I recently, uh, not to change the subject entirely, but I recently heard a song from the Soviet Union called Palestina that was in so uh, solidarity with Palestine. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, I think one of my favorite aspects of Soviet history is their solidarity with Palestinian liberation. Hmm. Well, that's how the USSR started. The USSR was a feudal uh, third world country, in effect, uh, not even industrialized, with hardly a working class at all. And yet it jumped into um, a socialist experiment because of the combined effect of a national struggle for independence from the superpowers and an anti-war movement against the First World War and peasant struggle for land. 
and I... national struggle of national minorities, you know, to be liberated from a centralized czarist regime. It all sort of, you know, accumulated, you know, like each revolutionary wave, you know, I express it in this way, each revolutionary wave climbs up on top of the other. So, and then eventually they have, you know, the critical mass necessary to carry out the revolution in opposition to the powers that be of the state. So this is a phenomenon which is called a combined revolution. Yes. And this was uh, elaborated on to some extent, you know, by uh, Bronstein, Trotsky, oh. in his permanent revolution the theory, and was actually put into effect by Mao, Mao Zedong, which combined the peasant revolution with the national revolution there in China, and it won. I, I actually read a book by, uh, well, it's not by Stalin, but it's a collected works of his uh, articles and Pravda, not Iskra and other magazines in this Russian Empire. Hmm. It's called oh, Stalin's, nice. Stalin's Collected Works, Volume 1. And yeah, there's one called uh, the Social Democratic Social Democracy and the national question. Uh huh. Yes. Well, you know, uh, Stalin's work on the national question was critiqued by the uh, comrades uh, uh, of the uh, Bundes movement in Phoenix, Arizona. But I must say that nonetheless, he treated the subject, and nobody else did. <laughs> you know, like so. Yeah. In effect, you know, he's giving sort of you know credibility, you know, to the national struggle, even if he sought to manipulate it, you know, for, for his own purposes and didn't really recognize uh, the Jewish struggle. And um, both he and Lenin had very nasty things to say about the Jewish Bund as well. But nonetheless, the Jewish Bund, you know, <clears throat> was there with its partisans to fight off the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union from the very beginning, even when the Red Army was demobilized. I honestly think both organizations have a lot of good points, honestly. Hmm. It's a very interesting, I think, for you to be able to read the uh, comments made on uh, Stalin's work on the national question. It was written up by, uh, I forget which comrade, you know, but it's in the manual. I think, uh, I can't remember if it's in book one or, or book two, the Manual of Revolution, which is online at academia.edu. The problem being that it's supposed to, you know, book one is supposed to be published, you know, in printed book form. And it was paid for, but the publisher, I think, is uh, censoring it. It's a, a Christian publisher in Atlanta, Georgia, and I think they freaked out. I haven't been able to get to the website that gets me there. Uh, it's so. very long. You know, there's so much, you know, to deal with there. And I've added you know, annexes in there, you know, which are very educational, like Ehrlich's critique of Zionism in the 1930s. And, uh, and also... Um, uh, I've uh, added in uh, Huey, Dr. Huey P. Newton on uh, uh, intercommunalism, his concept of intercommunalism as opposed to the nation state, and other very important documentations. Machno, the Ukrainian anarchist who fought off, you know, the royalists in the, in the uh, Civil War of 1918, stuff like that, you know, which uh, no other tendencies are willing to, uh, to promote, you know, because it doesn't conform to their uh, particular doctrine. Which is irrelevant, you know, because you can learn from all of the revolutionary socialist doctrines. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, becoming aware of what what uh, what contribution they've made, and also becoming aware of what mistakes they made at the same time. Nobody is without error. Can anybody hear me this time? Hey, uh, great. Okay, we can hear you now. Oh, and now his video is frozen. Come on, come back. Okay, there you are. Can you hear us now? Yeah, I, I don't know if you can see me, but yeah, uh, yeah, of course we can see you. Okay, go ahead. We okay. have a few minutes left on this uh, recording, so oh, uh, that's perfect. That's a few minutes. Yeah, think, just, yeah. So go ahead. You know, like what were you thinking of? You know, because we're talking about Zionism and anti-Semitism. What uh, points uh, would you make on those uh, on those relations? Zionism is anti-Semitism, and in theological terms, uh, as uh, the, the Zionist state is Amalek. 
And actually, that corresponds to being the bastard child of Esau. And if we know the Christians are the children of Esau, so it actually makes perfect sense. Twice removed. Think about it. Well, I'll think about it. I don't quite get it, but I'll think about it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're thinking about, you know, how anti-Semitism is being promoted now by those who are taking advantage of the anti-Zionist sentiment that's developing and using it, you know, to as a weapon against the Jewish people because they assume that Zionism is Jewish because the Zionist state says so. And so they accept the premise of Zionism in order to attack Zionism and promote anti-Semitism. And yet, you well, know, uh, they expose, you know, what Zionism is all about at the same time because it's promoting anti-Semitism in that fashion. I feel like it's a shame, but it's true that, that my... Uh... That my brother, given the fact that he is Jewish, is still anti-Semitic because of his surroundings, hmm. and uh, like he was talking about Lord Jacob Rothschild, who died quite recently, hmm. saying that the Jews control hmm. the media and everything. Huh. Well, I mean, there is a lot of Jewish investment in media because. And Hollywood, you know, because that's, you know, a Jewish thing, you know, writing and and uh, the uh, Moscow Yiddish theater and all that from which it arose. But I mean, know, it's, it's not really a hegemony, the big though. Bucks, the big bucks are not there. The big bucks, you just have to take a look at the list, you know, of the top rich people in the world. And last time I looked, there wasn't even one Jewish person there. Or maybe there was, you know, like with uh, Zuckerberg, you know, uh, being in the list. But, you know, like it's... You know, like minimal, you know, the Jewish presence is minimal. Okay, even though Jewish people, you know, are a rather small percentage of the world population. But nonetheless, you know, the Jewish, you know, uh, financial elite and bourgeoisie have been there for a long time. And they could, you know, make a lot of money, you know, during that time. But they don't control the United States of America like it's being alleged, you know. It's the United well, States of America, which is using Israel as its, you know, as its uh, bat, to beat right, so you know, the heads of the Palestinians right now. They're even sending soldiers over there. That's why uh, that uh, uh, Air Force uh, officer, Aaron Bushnell, committed suicide, you know, in protests, in extreme direct action by immolating himself because he was being assigned to go to, you know, fight in Israel. You know, they have American soldiers there right now, I have seen reported, fighting in the tunnels trying to eradicate Hamas. That's this means right. that America that that actually means America is participating in the Zionist genocide. Yeah, yeah. Not so trying to get, not trying to get massaged, but some people say that they if Israel fell, the U.S. would fall. I think it's the other way around. I, yeah. yeah, if 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 America fell, Israel would fall. That's actually how it would work, because the uh, the life support is all American, like. I mean, there's other donors to Israel, but the primary life support that Israel depends on is, is completely um, the, the backing of the United States of America. Um, oh, by the way, and that's, I, I, I was uh, looking at your, is that, that's your talus that you're wearing, I think, isn't it? Yeah, that's he's wearing a talus, definitely. It's quite an elaborate yeah. one. I like the trim on it on the top there. Yeah, it's it's very artistic. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have the one for my father. Oh, yeah, and the Palestine shawl, uh, shawl as well. Mm -hmm. I'll get my tapia here for it. Yeah. You, you, you were supposed to get me one of those, AB man. Yes, yes. But, you know, I heard about a guy who got shot because he was wearing a kafia. So, you know, I figured that if you were wearing that, you know, uh, there would be a lot of people down there in Arizona who might try to take a shot at you as well. What do you think? Oh, I got a crazy look for wearing one of them, so I think it would be a good idea. You can be shot out here for many reasons, and, and, and you know it really just depends. Everybody does whatever they want. It's chaos. You know, some people could run around in a tutu and nothing would happen, or they'd get beat up. It depends. I'll tell you what someone told me. It's like... This place I was at when I was wearing just a yarmulke, nothing crazy at all, and they called me the kite. They called, they called me a kike. That's it, man. They just said, 
Fuck mm. you, Coke. Mm. Well, uh, one time, one time, somebody uh, just because I serialist, I, I had, I made the mistake of wearing the yarmulke instead of a hat like this out in public. I heard fucking Jew, and I, I, um, when I hear that, I, I, and if you're white, I tend to say, well, you can't really be racist towards white white people, in my opinion. So I, I, I just basically replied, fucking honky, and then he threw a bunch of rocks at me. It wasn't <laughs> that exciting. What about the guys uh, who asked you if you were a Jew? The um, Arabic guys. Oh, that's what uh, concerns yeah. me more. Yeah, that was uh, that was um, that was one of the uh, that was one of the smoke shops, but not the ones one of the ones I go to, but I dropped by there, and um, the one guy like somehow guessed I was Jewish, and he said, "Are you Jewish?" And I said, "The uh, yes, you know," and you know, like they got jumped. Now this wasn't 